uh, just before your dinner time. Um, so the today's session will run for an hour and I will introduce you to our uh, distinguished lecturer uh, speaker to David. So today David will share with us the uh, latest evidence surrounding HVAC systems role in transmitting the SARS virus and preventing the spread of the virus to achieve healthier and more productive environments uh, in our buildings. And uh, David has got significant number of <laughs> abbreviations under his name, titles, but uh, you can see that on the on the flyer. But I will say David is one of our uh, Ashtray distinguished, distinguished Lecturer. He is a Director of Healthcare and Applied Engineering Markets uh, for Global Plasma Solution uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's a licensed designer uh, of engineering systems with over 40 years of experience in the design and analysis of heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems for a variety of verticals, but with a special focus on aerospace and healthcare uh, facilities. So I will start uh, sharing. OK, just before. So I will just take you through uh, so a few. Um, uh housekeeping rules so please keep your uh microphones muted and the session will be recorded and then available um on youtube on ashley midlands uh, chapters uh, youtube website so and um, if there is any issues you can get in touch with us uh via email and uh, let us know if you need uh, if you require any assistance and uh, david will stop uh regularly at after each uh, section and then he will give us a chance to ask any questions that you may have uh, feel free to turn on your camera and your microphone or uh, if you just would like to use the chat button then please just type up your comments and now we will ask david the session will last around 45 minutes and we will have at the end uh, 15 minutes uh, to thank david and uh, any questions that are uh, unanswered and we will address them at the end Thank you very much and enjoy the session. Thank you so very much. And real quickly, I have shared my screen and you should see in front of you a full screen view of my uh, the, the beginning of my presentation, uh, the HVAC systems role in improving environmental air quality in buildings of all types. Is that what you see? Absolutely, yeah. Perfect, here we go. All right, so uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be joining you from here across the pond. I am uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. I just ate lunch, so I'm not hungry, but most of you probably are. I know it's it's getting close to dinner time, so I can't thank you enough for, for taking time from your busy schedules on an empty stomach to, to sit through uh, my presentation. And, and um, one thing I want to make sure we do is, is have a dialogue back and forth. There, I got to tell you, there is nothing I hate more than sitting in front of a computer screen and talking to a screen and not to, to human individuals uh, on the other side of my views. So um, I will stop every so often and ask for questions, and I most wholeheartedly hope that you will uh, engage in conversation, questions, debate, whatever the case might be, or I'm here to, to, uh, to serve you, so to speak. So without further ado, I will launch into the presentation. I'm having a little trouble getting the slides to move forward. Do you see my next slide, balancing the HVAC system approach? Yep. Great, here we go. So that's how I'm going to start. I'm going to be talking about balancing the HVAC system approach and doing what I call create an HVAC system that contributes to indoor social distancing. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk a little bit about what social distancing at least was over the last couple of years up until most recently, at least here in the United States. In the past, indoor social distancing with regards to concerns uh, 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 around uh, the COVID pandemic was simply that when someone would walk up to the front door of a building before we let them in, we would typically stop them and we would say, hey, how are you feeling today? Do you feel sick? Have you been sick? Have you been around anyone that's sick? We might scan them for their temperature. And if they pass that gauntlet, we then might let them in through the front door and we would ask that they wear a good tight fitting mask over their face and that they maintain some distance between themselves and other individuals within the indoor environment, maybe, you know, two to three meters, something of that nature. And then we would have typically had our house cleaning staff following them around with uh, with wet wipes or 
Clorox or whatever the case might be. And, um, you know, disinfecting surfaces, not the usual once a week or twice a week or once a day, but maybe two or three times a day. And of course, with vaccinations, a lot of that has gone by the wayside of late at least here in the United States, I can't speak for you, but what we're seeing now are simply scenarios where people are re-engaging in the indoor environment uh, in, in very similar ways that they did prior to the to the pandemic. And not that that's bad, That's it's nice to have uh, an engaged public that feels comfortable walking inside of buildings, but the bottom line is we still have a lot of things in the air that are transmissible from one shape or one form to another. And we most certainly should be paying attention to what's going on in the air around us. And it has come to the point where the HVAC system might be the last bastion, so to speak, that can present a buffer between us as human beings in the environment and the stuff that is in the air that we're breathing and perhaps stuff that is being put to the environment from others that are there that may be ill. So what I'm going to talk about is what I call balancing the HVAC system approach to do exactly that, help clean the air and help create a buffer between us who are breathing in the environment and the stuff that's in the air that we're breathing. Now, that encompasses some methodologies that we're all familiar with. You know, up in the upper left hand corner of the slide, I start with ventilation. Ventilation is most certainly one of the cornerstones of a, a well-balanced HVAC system design approach. Ventilation is simply the amount of outdoor, hopefully clean, fresh outdoor air that we bring indoors from outside to help dilute the pollutants of concern within the built environment, as well as the number of air exchanges or air changes per hour that we provide to that space to help flush those contaminants of concern from the space and from the air. In the lower left hand corner, I have filtration. We rate filtration in MERV, M-E-R-V, here in the United States. I think you have a little bit different uh, uh, metrics system for filtration, but at the end of the day, what you want to make sure you do is select the system air cleaning filters that can extract by particle size the specific contaminants of concern from the air that you are concerned with, right? That makes all the sense in the world as well. So ventilation and filtration, I don't know how to rank them number one and number two. Maybe they're both number one, but they most certainly can provide the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to trying to create healthier, uh, more productive indoor environments from an indoor environmental quality standpoint, specifically with regards to the air. Then in the upper right-hand corner, relative humidity. We're hearing a lot about relative humidity of late, specifically that 40, 40 to 60, 60 percent relative humidity sweet spot that is proposed to be the best for us human beings from a physio physiological response perspective, and as well may be the worst from a standpoint of limiting a potential pathogen's viability in the air. 40 to 60 percent seems to be the best for us and the worst for certain pathogens in the air from a standpoint of their survival and their infectivity capabilities. Then if you'll drop down, if you will, please, to the bottom right-hand corner, I have adding to the mix what I call advanced indoor air quality solutions or technologies that may either make all of the components I talked about bundled more effective or perhaps even independently make ventilation, filtration, and or relative humidity more effective at what it is it tries to accomplish at the end of the day from a standpoint of contributing to indoor social distancing and cleaning the air. At the end of the day, this statement I think holds true as the COVID-19 pandemic progresses in time, there is a lower acceptance and adoption of control measures that impact on daily life and therefore an increased need for effective measures that do not rely upon human behavioral choices may be worth considering. Um, and that most certainly can be contributions made by the HVAC system. I'll stop real quickly and see if there might be any questions with regards to what I've just covered there so far. All right, you can still hear me, right? Yeah, there's nothing on the That's uh, fine. question box. It's early. 
<laughs> we'll keep going. Now, I draw your attention to the upper left-hand corner of my screen, and you see a young lady sitting in a room. She's holding her hand up in a sunbeam of light coming in through the window, and in that sunbeam of light is illuminated a bunch of stuff in the air that she's breathing. Now, that stuff is particles, right? And she's thinking to herself, my gosh, you know, I didn't realize all this stuff was here. You know, I've never seen it before. Until it's illuminated, you don't have a chance of seeing what's there. Most typically, it's very, very, very small. And she's thinking to herself, you know, I sit inside this room all day long and I'm breathing this air. What's that doing to me? Well, in in in, um, in reality, you know, we spend 90% of our time indoors. And as human beings, we breathe somewhere around 350 to 400 cubic feet of air every day. It's also interesting to note that it's not at all unusual in an environment such as what you see here, perhaps your home or perhaps a school or an office or a healthcare facility or a restaurant or a movie theater, whatever the case might be. It's not at all unusual to find anywhere from 18 to 20 million particles per cubic foot of air or more. And what are those particles? Well, they are everything that's in the air we're breathing. Think about that for a second. I'm going to let it soak in. Particles in the air consist of everything in the air that we are breathing. Everything is a particle at the end of the day. Now, some will argue, but I will say even atoms and molecules are particles. They're very small. They behave differently than larger particles, but they are particles. They are in the air, and we can be breathing them. And some of the things that consist of particulate matter in the air most certainly are viruses, including SARS-CoV-2 and others, bacteria, fungi, smoke, volatile organic uh, compounds, products of combustion from industry or automobiles or airplanes or whatever the case, uh, cruise ships if you're near a port, skin flakes, metals, pollens, everything, everything you can imagine can be a particle in the air we're breathing. So the conversation I'm going to have moving forward I think is very profound. And at the end of the day, I'm going to make this statement. We can go a long ways towards creating healthier, safer indoor environments from a standpoint of the air we breathe simply by removing the particles from the air, getting rid of the particles that you can see in the sunbeam. Now, the problem is that the ones we can see are just the tip of the iceberg from a standpoint of what's actually there. Of that 18 to 20 million particles per cubic foot, 98% of them by count can be smaller than 0.5 microns or micrometers. That is very, very, very small. And in fact, if you walk into a traditional uh, environment like this with your traditional handheld particle counter that starts counting at about 0.3 micrometers, you're going to miss counting about 95% of the particles that are there in the air. We cannot see them. We cannot count them very effectively with traditional counting uh, equipment and IEQ meters and things of that nature, but they are there in the air. So again, at the end of the day, clearing the sunbeam of the particles that are there, the ones you can see and the ones that aren't there, uh, that you can't see, will make a profound impact on creating a, a better environment for all of us who breathe that air. Now, we are being led down a path of late, and I'm going to take you down that path, and I'm going to start with an article that appeared in the American Journal of Infection Control probably two or three years ago now, and the title of that article was Particle Control Reduces Fine and Ultrafine Particles Greater Than HEPA Filtration in Live Operating Rooms, and then it goes on to talk about killing biologic warfare surrogate. This study and the testing was put together by a group of uh, industry leaders in medicine, in aerosol physics, in mechanical and electrical engineering, in HVAC and environmental control, and they went into a, an actual hospital operating room with high air exchanges and HEPA filtration and did particle counts and came back with some interesting information that you might not be aware of. They concluded in the article that the majority of airborne pathogens in the air, the stuff that we're talking about in the sunbeam that you can't see and you can see but can cause detrimental uh, effects to human beings, are what are considered ultrafine, fine or ultrafine particles. They said it's a common misconception that these small particles are effectively cleared from a space, even a hospital operating room, 
even using HEPA filtration. Now, HEPA filtration is 99.97% efficient at removing particles of 0.3 micrometers in size, and then more efficient removing both smaller and larger particles. Unfortunately, most very small particles and pathogens, they tell us, are of insufficient mass size weight to be controlled by what they call bulk airflow, but it's just traditional air movement and velocities that we see in the built environment and can remain suspended for days or even weeks. Significant fractions of these suspended particles and pathogens cannot be effectively transported to or removed by conventional air filters. They went on to say that, and this makes sense, listen carefully, it doesn't matter how efficient the air filter is. It could be 100% efficient. If the particles in the air can't get to the filter, for the filter to be able to extract them from the air, the filter can be efficient, but it may not be effective. And that's what we're going to talk about moving forward, making HVAC systems both more efficient and effective at clearing the sunbeam. Now, in uh, November of 2020, there appeared a uh, interview with the ASHRAE Environmental Task Force lead in the ASHRAE Journal magazine that year and that month. And the task force lead was talking specifically about ASHRAE's involvement in disseminating information to HVAC professionals such as ourselves about the best ways to help reduce the possibilities of airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 within built environments. And he said at that time, we have not seen evidence of the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through HVAC systems, although within a space, air motion caused by HVAC system components, as well as from fans, can be a factor. Then in the ASHRAE Journal magazine, January of 2021, there appeared a peer-reviewed ASHRAE Journal article talked about it, which was titled, Preparing HVAC Systems Before Reoccupying a Building. And the authors of that article stated that the growing science around far field aerosol transmission essentially negates the need for induct or air system control technologies such as UV or UVC lights. While these products and services may serve a useful function in most applications, they may not need the sp they may not meet the specific needs that are called for in mitigating the hazards of SARS-CoV-2. Then Another peer-reviewed ASHRAE journal article appeared in October of 2021 called Mitigating COVID-19 in Public Spaces. Now, the authors of that article said that even the most efficient filters in a centralized HVAC system potentially do not mitigate heavier droplets or other particles that do not get entrained into the return air vents and may float around a given space. What they're basically saying is there may be larger particles that filtration couldn't be effective at mitigating anyway. If you're within close range, they may hit you. They may fall onto a surface. You may touch them. But if the ones in the air don't get entrained into the return air vents, they can float around in the space, may, may not get back to filters, and therefore filters may not be that effective. What the evidence is simply suggesting is that the issues, specifically with regards to SARS-CoV-2, but others as well, appears to be emitted, originating in the space, and may be remaining in the space and not being transported back to HVAC systems as effectively as we might think they would be. And that is the way the evidence seems to be suggesting. Now, the icing on the cake was in March of 2021 when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the United States updated their COVID-19 ventilation in buildings frequently asked questions. And that question simply was, can COVID-19 be transmitted through HVAC ventilation systems? And their answer was, and still is, that while air flows within a particular space may help spread disease among people in that space, there is no definitive evidence to date that viable virus is, has been transmitted through an HVAC system to result in disease transmission to people in other spaces served by the same system. Now, there's good news and bad news. You know, the, 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 the good and bad news kind of combined. Here, here it is. If you and I are in a space together and I am sick and you are not, and I am talking to you, regardless of how far I am from you, if I'm ill and I am imparting respiratory droplets with viral material into the air that you are breathing, you may become 
infected. But the good news is simply that evidence is not suggesting that those components of harm in the air in the space we are within together are being transmitted throughout the HVAC system, which may mean everybody in the other spaces are somewhat buffered, right? It's not appearing to be transmitted that effectively or efficiently throughout the rest of the building. So the good news is while no one else may get infected or be in harm's way, the bad news is you, you could be. So what we need to do is look at solutions that can help eliminate that scenario. And the question simply becomes, what can we do? And I'm going to talk about that moving forward. But I'm going to stop for a second and I'm going to ask if you have any questions or comments. And I'm going to ask as well, is this new information to you or is this information that you've already had your head wrapped around for some time? Treating the issues of concern in the space. Um, David, um, this is not the answer to your current question, but there's a question in the box. It says, um, I have doubt that size of uh, COVID virus between 0 0.1 micron and 0 0.3. How could high standard MERF filters prevent? OK, so so I'll ask I'll answer that. The question simply was the virus is very, very, very small. Mm -hmm. How can a MERV rated filter help effectively extract it from the air? I think that's the question, right? Yeah. So first of all, it's important to understand that while the virus itself may be 0 0.1 or 0 0.09 micrometers in, in size, in aerodynamic size, vi the virons themselves are typically contained within a respiratory droplet that we expel from our lungs as we talk or cough or sneeze or breathe or sing or whatever the case might be, right? And those respiratory liquids or droplets are larger than the individual viron sizes themselves. They can be orders of magnitude larger. Now, the problem is simply that regardless of size, once they hit the environment outside of our lungs, they will desiccate, they will evaporate based on the relative humidity in the space, and they'll try to come into equilibrium with that uh, moisture content of the air. So they may start out relatively large, and those that are large enough to come out and hit something or come out and drop onto a surface become what's called possible fomite or direct contact sources of contamination, but the other ones that come out can desiccate to the point where they are very, very, very small, more in the range perhaps of 0 0.20 to 0 0.25 micrometers and larger, but they can remain suspended in the air for very long periods of times, almost indefinitely because those are still very, very, very small uh, droplet particle sizes. As well, we understand that in that form in the air as a respiratory droplet, they can remain infective for up to three hours. So that is a problem. Now the question is how can a MERV filter extract that from the air? First of all, if the particle can't get to the filter, it can't. I don't think anybody would agree with would, would argue with that, right? And the evidence is suggesting that if the filters are mounted in the HVAC system, if the viral, viral material isn't being transmitted through HVAC systems, there may be a disconnect between how efficient a filter can be and how effective that filter is. Um, but it's important to understand that MERV filters or however you rate a filter, their base, their, their efficiency rating is based on what's called the most penetrating particle size, MPPS. That is the most difficult size, micron size of a particle for that filter to extract from the air. Now with a HEPA filter, for example, the most penetrating particle size and, and most other MERV filters is somewhere in the area of 0 0.3 micrometers. But based on the, on the, uh, uh, filtration uh, methods of filtration um, that occur uh, and and there's 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 an array of them that that impact a filter's ability to extract a particle zero that 0 0.3 most penetrating particle size is the hardest particle size for that filter to extract that's where you rate its efficiency so a HEPA is 99.97 percent efficient at extracting particles at a most penetrating particle size of 0 0.3 micrometers it can more efficiently extract both larger and smaller particles. And it's just based on the methods of filtration. And I don't have time to go into them right now, but in discussion uh, after the presentation, I can bring up some slides that, that show what those mechanisms are and we can talk about them in more detail should, should you want to. It is very important to understand that a MERV filter is and can be more efficient at extracting both larger and smaller particles than that for which it is rated 
but it's important to understand as well, it may not be efficient if the particles cannot get back to the filter. Well, it can still be efficient. It'll be efficient as rated, but it may not be effective because it can't get the particles to it to extract it from the airstream. I hope that answered the question, and I don't want to beat on that any longer right here. Let's get, we'll get through the presentation and then we can handle that question again in Q&A should it come up. Any other questions before I move on? Um, a lot of people are typing, but nothing came up. I think you carry on. <laughs> I will. Yeah, we'll pick up on the next round. So again, again, I left you with the question, what can we do? And there are things we can do, but we most certainly should look at treating the issues of concern in the space, specifically with regards to SARS-CoV-2, but perhaps other very small contaminants of concern in the air that cannot effectively be transported through traditional air movement back to the HVAC system where we may have a technology installed in the system that is tasked with remediating or removing it. There are things in the space we can most certainly do. On the far left hand side of the screen, I show what's called in space upper room UVGI or UVC lights. Those have been proven very effective at helping to mitigate certain contaminants of concern from the air we breathe within the space itself. It typically consists of a box and in that box is a UVC bulb of some type, of some length, of some wattage. There's typically not a fan associated with it. You mount it at least seven feet, if not more, above the finished floor line towards the ceiling, and you direct the louvers that are on the face of the device covering the lights to reflect upwards so that its luminance or the photons that are emitted to the air are directed upward. We cannot have UVC light being directed downward into an occupied space with human beings because it can be detrimental to our health. These devices then typically will rely on either mechanical or natural ventilation in the space to help circulate the pollutants of concern through the field of luminance that's been directed upward so that over time, it has, an, it has enough contact time, enough dose to be able to inactivate those contaminants within the air that are in direct contact with the light source. Now, a device like this, for example, might cover approximately 200 square feet of floor area. So depending on the size of the room that you put it in, you may have two or three or four or eight or 10 of these around the outside of the room or perhaps in the center of the room. And if there's enough air circulation, that occurs, typically four to six air changes per hour. These have been found to be very effective at helping to remediate certain issues of concern in the space and the air we're breathing. As well, in the center of the slide, I show what I call in-space portable HEPA air filter machines. This is typically a box. It has a fan. It has a typically a HEPA filter, which is 99.97% efficient at 0 0.3 micrometers. You wheel it into the space, you plug it in, you turn it on, typically on high. And if you have sized it properly for the number of air exchanges in the space that might be recommended by certain authorities or agencies, it can circulate the air in the space. And if it can, through circulation, bring those contaminants of concern back to it, so that they can come in contact with the HEPA filter inside the machine, they may be extracted from the airstream. They can be very effective as well. And on the right-hand side of the screen, I have what I'll call advanced air cleaning technologies that can work both in the space or some can actually be installed in the HVAC system and reach out into the space from there. Some of those technologies are needlepoint bipolar ionization, bipolar ionization, photocatalytic oxidation, dry hydrogen peroxide. There's a list of a few more that, that um, can be added to that specific category. They are not all the same. They do work differently from one another. It's important not to lump apples and oranges together in the same basket and then try to figure out what's what. Each has its own specific way of achieving results. Now, in full disclosure, I work for the manufacturer of a bipolar ionization technology, but in full disclosure as well, in the November 2020, 2021 <laughs> ASHRAE Journal Magazine, I wrote an article on bipolar ionization. It was a peer-reviewed ASHRAE Journal article. Now, I don't know if, if any of you have had a chance to read it. I assume we have ASHRAE members out there, so you all have the magazine in your inbox. It's just how busy you've been and it, whether or not you've had a chance to read it. But if you haven't yet, I most certainly hope you will. And I'm going to be talking specifically about bipolar ionization because it's what I know best, because 
it recently appeared in the Ashray Journal magazine, and because there's been a, an, an outreaching of um, not only Ashray members but uh, IAQ professionals across the uh, the world wanting more information on this specific technology. So moving forward, that is what I'll talk a little bit more about in depth as we move forward. But I will stop at this point in time and ask if there's any questions with regards to what I've covered so far up to this slide. Um, no, David, there's no okay. more questions. Let's Thank keep you. going. So I am going to be talking about ionization. I am going to be talking about bipolar ionization. Let's talk about what all that is. I'll give you the definition of an ion real quickly, if I may. An ion is simply an atom or molecule in the air that has been imparted an electrical potential. It is either positively or negatively charged. A neutral atom or molecule is not an ion. It has to have electrical potential applied to it. Bipolar ionization is simply the combination of the air in both positive and negatively charged atoms or molecules. It's that simple. You most certainly can count ions in the air, although you cannot see them, you cannot smell them, you you do feel them, but you don't know it. You, you can't, um, you, you, you know, they're just almost, you can't hear them. Uh, the only way that to know that they're there is to count them with a handheld ion counter or a system mounted or space mounted ionization counter of some type. The one you see in the center of this picture is the one that I'm holding in my hand right here. Uh, it's a it's a uh, ion counter that I own, and um, I take that with me when I go out into nature and I count ions. Now let me tell you why I do that. Where ions are imparted naturally to the earth are in outdoor environments through phenomena such as, for example, on the left hand slide, side of the slide, lightning strikes. You can imagine the potential of a high voltage lightning strike to impart a charge of energy to the atoms and molecules that surround that bolt of lightning. And when you stop and realize that we have thousands of thunderstorms across the face of the earth every day, and there are literally hundreds of lightning strikes every second, everywhere across the face of the earth, that has the potential to highly charge the outdoor air with positively and negatively charged ions as well. You see a picture of me in the middle with my handheld ion counter in front of a waterfall in North Carolina, close to where I live. There's something called the Leonard effect. It's spelled L-E-N-A-R-D. It's pretty cool. Google it. It's an interesting subject to read about. But basically, the Leonard effect talks about the fact that when you take a droplet of water and you break it apart, it will impart a charge of negative energy to the air that surrounds the droplet of water, and it will leave behind in the droplet of water a positive charge. It's called the Leonard effect. It will highly ionize the air as well. You see me with my handheld ion counter, uh, maybe 20 feet from where the water is cascading over the rocks and breaking apart. I am reading an ion concentration there of about 55,000 ions per cubic centimeter. Now, a cubic centimeter of air is very, very, very small. And 55,000 ions per cubic centimeter may sound like a huge quantity, but when you consider the number of atoms that are in that cubic centimeter of air, it's still relatively small or relatively insignificant. But the point is simply this, where the air is the most highly ionized is outdoors where the ions are imparted to the air. Those ions are imparted through nature for various reasons, but one of the reasons they're there is to help clean the air because these atoms and molecules have an energy potential they can produce certain effects on contaminants in the outdoor air to try to help keep it cleaner. I promise you I will talk about that moving forward. But where you see higher ion concentrations outdoors, perhaps in the range of uh, 10,000 to 50,000 ions per cubic centimeter, as you work your way inland from outdoors where the air is the cleanest to urban environments where we have more heavily polluted the air, those ion concentrations are diminished as they work to help mitigate, remediate certain pollutants and contaminants in the air. And in fact, in an urban environment, such as um, downtown London, for example, you might be lucky to read 1,000 ions per cubic centimeter. And then when you come inside a building where the Environmental Protection Agency tells us 
indoor environments can be five to ten times more polluted than the environments immediately outdoors of the building, those ion concentrations are reduced even further. Orders of magnitude from what they were, where they were imparted by nature and the air is cleaner. What we are doing with bipolar ionization is simply imparting an artificial charge of energy to the atoms and molecules in the air that cross over the device, go out through the HVAC system into the space itself to try to create ion concentrations in the space that are at a closer level to those outdoors where the air is cleaner. It's that simple. It's a very simple concept. And that's what I'll talk about moving forward. Any questions on that? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, there is none at the moment. Thank you. Okay, sure. Now, what's very important to understand about any of the categories of electronic air cleaning technology that I've talked about so far is that with regards to ASHRAE standard 62.1 ventilation for acceptable indoor air quality, section 5.7.1, it is important to make sure that that air cleaning device, and that is anything electric or electronic. I'll say it again, anything electric or electronic including UVC lights, including needlepoint and bipolar ionization, including photocatalytic oxidation, dry hydrogen peroxide, electronic air cleaners, uh, polarized air cleaning media filtration, whatever the case might be. It shall be listed and labeled in accordance with Underwriters Laboratory Standard 2998 and validated for zero ozone emissions. If you want to comply with the ASHRAE standard, and if you want to comply with recommendations from the Centers for Disease and Prevention, the CDC, here in the United States. Underwriters Laboratory is an agency here in the UL that will validate and test manufacturers' products. A manufacturer sends their electronic air cleaning technology to UL. They put it in a ozone test chamber. They put an ozone testing device two inches off the emitters of whatever the device might be, the electronic components of the device. They turn it on, they run it for 24 hours. And if at any time over that 24 hour period, it emits any more than five parts per billion of ozone to the environment, it's kicked out the door and it doesn't pass. It's not validated. So to be validated for UL 2998, your product must emit no more than five parts per billion ozone to the environment. That is a very, 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 very small concentration, almost undetectable. Um, so you want to make sure regardless of, of whose or what's you're, lo you're looking at from adding some type of an advanced electronic air cleaning technology that it is validated to this important UL standard. And that is most specifically UL 2998. Any questions on that? Sometimes that brings up a lot of questions. Um, are, are you all aware of that? Are you applying electronic air cleaning technologies? Are you trying to comply with ASHRAE ventilation standards? And if you are, are you validating the products to this UL standard? I'm asking. So, so David, I can just kind of add a comment because probably to, to, to your question that what we see in the UK, like likes of Sage Group or Sibzi, although they do not directly refer to UL2998, they do raise that point that, you know, if any consumer wants to use this technology, you know, they would have to uh, make sure that the technology does not produce ozone or byproducts. You know, um, I think that's what I kind of see. So not a, not a question, but just a comment to complement what, what I'm seeing in the UK. Um, others might have some comment, but uh, I thought those, uh, those interesting. It's a good comment. Do you all get ozone days where, you know, Typically during the summer, in more polluted urban environments on a sunny day, uh, the government or the local agency will come out and say, yeah, ozone alert, go inside, close up the building, and don't come out and breathe. Do you ever get those over there? I'm sure you do. We get them here in the U.S. all the time during the summer. Ozone is, is a toxic gas. Ozone is a respiratory irritant. Ozone is most certainly something we don't want to be emitting to the indoor environment particularly where we are trying to create healthier and more productive indoor environments for the people indoors breathing that air. So ozone compliance and zero ozone emissions are a very important thing for you to at least be aware of moving forward, regardless of whether or not it's called for uh, through local codes and standards, you should be aware of what it is and why you don't want to be producing it in, in the jobs that you're designing. Any comments or questions? Um, yes. Um 
the question is, can there be too much ions, ions in the space? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, the the studies and efficacy that I have read so far do not lean in that direction. There are no specific ion concentration codes or standards that I'm aware of anywhere other than the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation does mandate minimum and maximum ion concentrations in built environments throughout Russia. Those concentration levels are a minimum of 400 ions per cubic centimeter, positive and negative, so a total of 800 ions per cubic centimeter, minimum up to 100,000 ions per cubic centimeter, positive, 100,000 ions per cubic centimeter negative for a total of 200,000 ions per cubic centimeter. Uh, rarely, if ever, will you find indoor environments provided with ionization technology that come anywhere near that maximum level. Typically, the 400 ions per cubic centimeter, positive and negative, are on the low end baseline of what you might find in the indoor air through natural occurrences, such as bringing in outdoor air that's more highly ionized. Does that answer the question? And if not, uh, I'll be happy to talk more about it or we can cover it in Q&A. Um, no, it says, uh, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Why why in Russia is being recorded then? Don't know. You know them. <laughs> you know why? I don't know why they do a lot of the things they do. <laughs> don't ask me. And I'm not asking them. Not right now. You know, right I on. don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Jap J Japan as well, I think, has some loosely based um, recommendation in, in similar fashion to what the Russian, Russian Federation has suggested um, for their built professional, uh, built environment professionals. Don't hold me to that. I'd have to do some research. I know I've, I've got a file with thousands of documents in it on all of this stuff. I'd have to go back and try to find it. But I know the Russian Federation most certainly does. And I have that document. If anybody wants it, just reach out to me. I'll send it to you. It's boring. <laughs> it's boring, but you can read it. <laughs> All right. Keep going. Um, there are more people typing, but there's nothing appeared here, so I'll let you go. All right. um, we'll, yeah, we'll keep just going. Okay. We'll have a good Q&A, I think. So now I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the uh, capabilities of ionization with regards to uh, mitigating, remediating certain issues of concern in the air. And I think this is the most profound benefit of ionization by far, and it's what I'll call agglomeration by attraction. Now, I mentioned to you that what we are doing with ionization, bipolar ionization in particular, is imparting an energy charge, both positive and negative, to the atoms and molecules that cross over the device, go out through the ductwork, through the registers and grills, and mix with the issues of concern that may be in the air in the space we're breathing. Now, Think of these positive and negatively charged atoms and molecules in similar fashion to magnets, which have polarity. Magnets are either positively or negatively polarized. And what happens when we bring a positive and a negative magnet, opposite polarities in close contact with one another? Clink, opposites attract. They are uh, polarized to adhere to one another, to do what I'll call agglomerate. The two become one and they become bigger. Uh, think for a moment, uh, if I have a handful, let's say I have 100 very, very, very small positively polarized magnets in my left hand. I have a 100 very small negatively polarized magnets in my right hand, and I throw them onto a table in front of me. What's going to happen? They're going to come together. They're going to attract to one another and they're going to clump into one great big ball of magnets that I now can pick up with one hand and perhaps more easily transport than trying to juggle 200 magnets, 100 in each hand, in similar fashion to the particles in the air, in the sunbeam, those that we can see and those that we can't see. The ionized atoms and molecules will go out into the air and make sure that the particles are charged oppositely because it's bipolar ionization and then those particles will adhere are electrostatically attract to one another. And over time, clink, 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 they will become bigger. And because they have become bigger, we have increased their mass and their size. And because we have increased their mass and size, it is now easier for lower air exchanges or lower air velocities to help transport them through the air. And because they are bigger, it is also easier 
for filters to be able to extract them. But the important thing is because they are bigger and transportable, we can now get them back to HVAC system mounted air filters that now can be efficient from the install, but effective in application because the particles actually get to them. This is nothing more than clean room technology. We, uh, the very first job I ever did in the industry in 1982, uh, when I went to work for Carrier was a clean room application where we did a couple of things. Number one, we designed the clean room for 200 air changes per hour. Think of that, 200. Think of the air movement and the velocities associated with 200 air changes per hour. I can more effectively propel smaller particles at higher velocities as well. We installed ULPA, ULPA filtration. I think that was 99.99997% efficient, right? So I increased air exchanges and air movement to help better transport smaller particles. I increased the filtration efficiency to be more effective at extracting those particles that I'm attempting to move out of the space. And then I ionized the environment as well to help electrostatically attract the small particles one to another to make them more effectively and quickly transported through the air back to the filters. That's how you do a clean room. We don't have 200 air exchanges in most traditional built environments that we work with from a commercial perspective. Here in the United States, we design hospital operating rooms for 20. It's an order of magnitude less than I was designing for in clean room applications. So you can see how a clean room might differ from a more traditional environment. What bipolar ionization technology is, is simply a clean room technology that is now being applied to more commercial environments to help make commercial environments more effective at getting the stuff out of the air, clearing the sunbeam. Think for a minute, if you will, of a sailboat. Sailboat out in the middle of the ocean, the mast is up, the sail is down. A gale force wind can come along, and all that sailboat's going to do is probably rock back and forth. The sailboat's too heavy, and there's not enough air velocity to effectively move the sailboat across the water. But what happens when I open the sail on that sailboat? Instantaneously, a very gentle breeze can come along and quite effectively transport that sailboat across the water. That's what bipolar ionization does to particles. It opens their sail. And I'll stop now and ask if there's any questions with regards to this. Yes, uh, we have uh, two questions. So the first one uh, is, does the ionization device continually monitor ozone levels in space? How is the secondary production of ozone by ions combining with oxygen? OK, so. <laughs> Uh, typically, most ionization technologies themselves do no monitoring unless you install ancillary monitoring equipment in the space to be able to do that for you or for your client. So, for example, you may buy vendor A's ionization technology and install it in the HVAC system, and then you might purchase and install vendor B's uh, air measurement and verification system. It could do temperature, relative humidity. It could do CO2. It could do ozone. It could do formaldehyde. It could do ions. It could do particles, PM10, 2.5, and smaller. It could do VOCs and things of that nature if you want to prove efficacy. And I highly recommend that on anything that you install. I think it's important not only to understand the science, science that's been there for ionization technology. If you read this article, You'll, you'll, you'll understand that bipolar ionization is rooted in some 150 years of technological advancement. This is not the new kid on the block. It's been around a while. But you need to understand the science and believe in the science. You need to believe in, the, in, 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 in whatever vendor you're working with and the information that they put forth from a standpoint of their testing and efficacy. And then as well, hold them to, the ta hold them to task and install equipment that will measure actual results in the space to prove the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. We're not doing that on filters. We probably should be. Everybody assumes you put a HEPA filter into an HVAC system and it's going to get rid of 99.97% of the 0 0.3 micron size particles and more larger and smaller. Not unless the particle gets to it. That's the difference between efficiency and efficacy that needs to be measured in the space environment itself. I highly recommend you do that. And then I'm going to leave it at that to get through this. So we, because because we're, we're we're honing in on time. I haven't got a whole lot left. And then in Q and A, if there's anything more with regards to that, I'll be happy to address it. Is that all right? 
Yep, that's good cool. questions, you. though. Keep them coming. I'll hang around as long as you want. OK, so let's move on. This kind of um, talks about exactly what I was trying to show you in the, in the previous slide. This is a uh, this is an actual test and study results from research that was done by the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, their Department of Civil Architectural Environmental Engineering back in August of 2021 by Dr. Brent Stevens, who is renowned in the um, IAQ arena um, from a standpoint of, uh, of doing testing on IAQ technologies. And what they did was they took a portable HEPA filtration machine and they tested it in a CADAR type testing. Is everybody familiar with CADAR, C-A-D-R testing? I'll tell you real quickly what it is and we can talk more about it in Q&A. CADAR is clean air delivery rate. A manufacturer can ship their portable air filtration device to AHAM, which is the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. They have a test chamber. They will put it in that test chamber. They will fill that test chamber with particles of various sizes. They will turn the air filtration machine on. The particles are in the space. The air filtration machine is the space, is in the space, and they will prove through testing how many of those particles are removed from the air by the air cleaning device and then they will give it a KDAR rating, clean air delivery rate. So let me give you a real quick example. Let's say I, I wheel a, a machine into the space that is rated for 500 CFM of air movement and let's say I can remove 90% of the particles that are tested, the KDAR rating of that unit would then be 400 CFM. OK, I think or 450, whatever it is, right? It's a high percentage. And then depending on how many particles are or are not removed, the KDAR ratings can be either higher or lower. But it's a direct measurement of the air cleaner's ability to remove particles of certain sizes from the air in the space where the particles are being emitted and where the air cleaning device itself is positioned. So it's a measurement of efficiency and effectiveness all in one. If you can improve the KDAR rating of an air cleaner, you've gone a long way to making it better. It can deliver more equivalent clean air to the space. It has removed more contaminants from that air. The testing done by Brent Stevens and his built environment research team showed that in an ionized environment, this air cleaner was capable of removing 20 to 50% more of the particles in the air that were emitted to the environment for testing. So in the ionized environment, based on over here on the right hand side, certain particle sizes of concern, for example, 0 0.9 to 1 micrometer, the ionized environment made the KDAR rating of that standalone filtration machine 44% better. Don't pay attention to the negative. You got to read the report. With regards to dust, 0 0.5 to 3 micrometers in size, it made the KDAR rating 19% better. And with regards to pollen, the 5 to 10 micrometer size, it made the KDAR rating 53% better. It improved the KDAR rating somewhere between 20 and 50% based on ionizing the air versus an environment where the air was not ionized with some type of bipolar ionization device. Now, when you look down here, based on numerous studies measuring the size distribution of influenza bioaerosols. It's been concluded that 20% of flu bioaerosols are in the 0.3 to 1 micron range, 29% at the 1 to 3 micron range, and 51% at the 3 to 10 micron range. Right over here, you can see the improvement in effectiveness that ionization may have on being able to remove those specific influenza contaminants of concern from the air. I think that's profound. Now, you got to connect the dots. I am not suggesting that influenza testing has been done by this group in a ionized versus non-ionized environment, but I'm I'm just connecting dots and adding information that may be worth considering as you move forward looking at trying to create, you know, a, a an HVAC system that has more effectiveness at doing what it's supposed to do. Now there are manufacturers of specific electronic air cleaning technologies that have certainly tested through sensitivity testing, simulation testing, and special test, specialty testing, certain contaminants of the concern of concern in the air and on surfaces, and proven the ability through third-party laboratory testing to be able to number one either inactivate or kill viruses and pathogens based on what they are over a certain amount of time, 
over a certain perhaps ion concentration at a specific rate of reduction. Let me real quickly say viruses are not living. You don't kill them. All right. Viruses are a, uh, a single cell organism that are transmitted by by a, uh, a host of some type to a susceptible host, one human to another, for example. A virus can be inhaled. A virus can attach itself to your um, to, to your internal organs and it can in, in, in structurally infect, infect uh, and take over the cells, uh, replicating, killing cells and creating disease. Pathogens, for example, might be things like bacteria and molds and fungi. They are a living organism that are capable of proliferation on their own. So you will either inactivate a virus and render it incapable of infectivity, or you may be able to kill a pathogen and render it incapable of reproducing. Of proliferating. So that's what these tests point to. But again, I think the profound benefit of ionization technology in particular is simply its ability to clear the sunbeam. You know, because at the end of the day, everything in the air is a particle. If I can remove the particles from the air that I'm breathing and they're not there, I think it's relatively straightforward that they, they can't hurt me or at least they'll have a lesser chance. This is a technology as well that has been used in the past in hospital applications, for example, to help remediate issues with odors, helicopter landing, exhaust odors, backup diesel generator odors, et cetera, have been remediated through ionization technology as well. The technology can be installed upstream of cooling coils to help remediate and remove, uh, uh, limit the, um, the, the reproduction of microbial growth, such as bacteria, mold, and fungi on cooling coils. We'll talk more about that in Q&A if you have questions. This is my, my poor man's rendition of how the technology might look installed in the system. On the left-hand side, I have a space, and in that space there are, of course, certain issues of concern. On the right-hand side, I have an HVAC system. We all know what that is. I'm not going to walk through it, but at the end of the day, the HVAC system is tasked with removing air from the space, doing things to it to temper it and clean it and return it to the space better, hopefully, than the condition that it left. And it can do that, but making it more effective is most certainly a great idea. I show a bipolar ionization technology installed in the HVAC system emitting ionization, charging the air that goes over and through the device with a positive and negative ionization potential. Those ions then flow out through the ductwork, through the registers and grills, and mix with the room air itself. It's treating the air where it's suggested that we may need to treat it to be the most effective, and it then begins doing what it does on various contaminants of concern. But at the end of the day, its most profound benefit is that it will agglomerate those particles over time, make them bigger, make them more transportable, get them from the space back to the HVAC system and perhaps back to filters that were less effective at extracting those particles of concern than they were before the environment was ionized. If this was a technology of some type that could not reach out into the space and influence the return of those contaminants to the HVAC system, it might not be as effective as we would hope or as we might imagine it would be. It might be very efficient, it just might not be overly effective. Bipolar ionization technology or others that I've mentioned can typically be installed in traditional HVAC systems almost anywhere. So starting in the space, perhaps in a HEPA filtration machine that's been wheeled into the space, perhaps in the ductwork adjacent to the space, perhaps further back in the ductwork, perhaps inside a furnace or a fan coil or a small air handling unit, perhaps inside of a VAV box, perhaps inside of a mini split or a VRF fan coil unit indoors, or perhaps on the roof or in the basement in larger packaged rooftop units or built up air handling unit systems. ASHRAE has 55 years of familiarity with bipolar ionization. On the left hand side, I show one of the first ASHRAE journal, journal articles I could find talking about bipolar ionization from 1966. I was eight years old, do the math, I'm old, <laughs> but the point is that this was an article that talked about using bipolar ionization specifically for its impact on helping make clean rooms clean. In the center is an article that appeared in May 2006, again another peer-reviewed ASHRAE journal article that talked about using bipolar ionization through the ASHRAE standard 62.1 IEQ procedure to reduce outdoor air and to uh, save energy. Um, it showed a profound impact on energy savings as well as its impact on making the air cleaner. 
Um, and it also won ASHRAE's 2006 uh, Technology Award for Advanced, uh, I don't remember exactly what they called it, but I think it was Advanced Application HVAC Systems. And then on the right-hand side is the article that I wrote in November of 2021, a bipolar ionization primer for HVAC professionals. I certainly hope that you will will um, take an opportunity to read that and, and reach out to me with questions or comments. I'd love to hear them, good or bad. But in that first article on the left-hand side that appeared 55 years ago, the authors summarized at that point in time that there were no less than 300 technical papers relating to the physiological characteristics of ionization. Most of the papers suggested some value in the generation or control of ionization. And at that time, they had found no information to suggest that ionization is unhealthy to the human environment. And um, I more or less, if you will, had a statement of similar um, effect in the article that I wrote most recently, 55 years later. Um, ASHRAE's position on BPI is simply that they consulted with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And while the CDC does not provide recommendations for or against any manufacturer or any manufacturer's product, not only bipolar ionization, but others, um, they noted that bipolar ionization has been around for decades. The technology has matured and many of the earlier potential safety concerns, mostly ozone, are reported and now resolved. They say that if you are considering the acquisition of bipolar ionization equipment, you will want to be sure that the equipment meets UL2998 standard certification, which we talked about, uh, which is intended to validate that no harmful levels of ozone product are produced. They also went on to, to say that, that to suggest that as with all emerging technology, consumers are encouraged to exercise caution and do their homework. Consumers should research the technology attempting to match any specific claims against the consumer's intended use. Consumers should request efficacy performance data that quantitatively demonstrates a clear protective benefit under conditions consistent with those for which the consumer is attending to apply the technology. Preferably, the documented performance data under as used conditions should be available from multiple sources, some of which should be independent third party sources. I would never argue with that. I've been an ASHRAE member for 40 years. I've been an ASHRAE distinguished lecturer for several years. I sit on the ASHE, which is the American Society for Healthcare Engineering uh, uh, task for, uh, uh, immediate task force response team. Those are great suggestions. And any times I or others within my profession are looking at utilizing something that's being applied to the indoor environment, it's a great suggestion. I wholeheartedly um, promote that, those um, sentiments on ASHRAE's part. ASHRAE has formed a new TG, which is a technical group two for reactive air cleaning system technologies. It has just been implemented and put in place. And in fact, they had their first meeting at the last ASHRAE AHR in uh, Vegas, Las Vegas, I believe. Um, it is a TG group, a technical group right now. It is uh, taking on membership that it will be tasked with uh, providing uh, standards and testing protocols and procedures for all advanced, what I would call reactive air cleaning system technologies, including bipolar ionization, needlepoint bipolar ionization, dry hydrogen peroxide, photocatalytic oxidation, and others. This is something that we've needed for a long time. The industry uh, and its heightened concern with SARS-CoV-2 and hopefully its long lasting impact on indoor air quality positions this committee at the perfect time to move forward in the advancement of some of what has been considered up to now to be emerging air cleaning technologies. And with that, I'll leave you with a quote from one of my favorite past ASHRAE Journal presidents, Tim Wentz, who served back in 2016 to 2017, if any of you were old enough to remember that. And his quote simply at that time during his inaugural uh, speech was simply, the greatest challenge we face today is the failure to adapt to change. And I think that statement was as applicable then as it is now, as it will be 100 years from now. And with that, I thank you and open it up for questions and comments. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Yes, um, that was really good, actually. Uh, I did my MSCs in uh, ventilation effectiveness in classrooms. I almost felt like I was in a lecture and I could have done with the session before my <laughs> I started my <laughs> MSCs, but yeah, thank you. Uh, so where we left, we had some questions from earlier. Uh, one of them was, would air temperature and humidity affect uh, agglomeration? 
uh, not within the realm of what we typically see in indoor built environments, including industrial and more, um, in, uh, I, I'll call industrial environments, healthcare, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, clean room environments, uh, of course, office buildings, schools, uh, homes, uh, those types of things. There's there's nothing um, that has been studied or documented to be an issue of concern within the realms of what we typically see in those environments. That does that answer the question? I hope it does. Okay. I can't tell you what could happen at a 200 degrees Fahrenheit and zero percent relative humidity. We just don't know. It hasn't been studied. But with again within the realm of what you would consider traditional uh, mm. conditions of of comfort in those environments, nothing we're aware of that would impact agglomeration. What really impacts agglomeration is how highly the air is ionized and how many particles are, and of what size are in the space. Okay. Thank you for that. And the next question is the main difficulty is to prove its effectiveness. The only thing that can be done is measuring ion, ions. Is there a, a certitude PM slash VOC and others, other figures will decrease when measuring before and after Needle point bipolar ionization. Yeah, great question. So, you know, again, back to how do you prove its efficacy? You most certainly can measure ion concentrations. Uh, let me just go back to that slide just for fun so we can tee up the conversation because this usually people have a lot of questions on counting them. You most certainly can measure ion concentrations with a handheld, both indoors and outdoors, in the space at the device, but handhelds can be cumbersome. So you as well can install devices that measure ion concentrations indoors, outdoors, in the space, in the ductwork that can be hard mounted and wired back to the BAS as well. You most certainly can do the same indoors and outdoors with regards to counting and measuring, measuring and verifying almost anything that's in the air that you want to measure and verify, including temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, volatile organic compounds, ozone, CO2, particles of all size ranges, depending on the sophistication and the price of the instrumentation that you install, the sky's the limit. And I most certainly recommend you find out what the concentrations are before you turn the technology on and you give the technology a reasonable amount of time based on its specific operational requirements to create efficacy and then measure the proof of effectiveness. All for it. I am. I think others, other manufacturers would, would probably say the same thing. Okay, and the other question is, is there a limiting duct air velocity for effective bipolar ionization installations? So we, uh, from what I have read uh, and, and gleaned from uh, most of the um, manufacturers uh, installation and operation instructions on bipolar ionization, they typically will recommend a range somewhere starting around 200 feet per minute, but the higher the velocity, the better. So within the realm of traditional HVAC systems, we're typically dealing with about 500 feet per minute. Sorry, I, I can't make the conversions on the fly to, to meters per second, but you know, at a cooling coil, 500 feet per minute is pretty traditional. And then you may see the velocities in the ductwork being three or four times that initial velocity across the cooling coil. So you may see 1,000 to 2,000 feet per minute in the ductwork. Those are not an issue of concern at all. And in fact, the quicker you move the ions off the device, the quicker they will get to the space and the less chance there is for them to contact one another. And just through physical contact, um, uh, uh, you know, become inactive. There's, there's, there's many ways that a charged a atom or molecule in the air can can lose its charge or dissipate. One is for it to touch one another, right? Positive to negative, it's done. Another way is for it to touch an oppositely charged surface. Another way is for it to interact with a contaminant in the air that it comes in contact with. So typically, with bipolar ionization, you have a a, a finite amount of time to get the ions from where you make them to the space. An artificially produced ion will typically last somewhere around 60 seconds, but you typically want to try to get it to the space within 20 to 30 seconds so that you get as many as you can to the space and you give what you get to the space enough time to, to, to have efficacy and interact with the contaminants that may be there that you're trying to remediate. Understand as well, you are constantly bringing new ions in to replace those that have been uh, 
uh, dissipated through an interaction of some type. So you've got a constant in ion concentration or flux reaching the indoor environment. It's important to understand no airflow, no ions. And it's important to understand that the higher the ventilation rate effectiveness in the space, the better the ions can mix with the contaminants in the space, the better results you should have. Another thing that's important to understand is that you may be emitting a high concentration of ions at the register or grill in the space. And then you'll take your handheld ion counter into the center of the space and you may see diminished concentrations. The problem is simply that those ions that have been emitted to the space are working on the contaminants that are there. They're being dissipated. And over time, as those contaminants are removed, the ion concentrations, the residual ion counts will increase. So that now when you walk in with your handheld ion counter, in a steady state space that has been cleared of certain contaminants, you will read higher ion concentrations over time. Does that make sense? I, I, I kind of rambled. I, I hope I hope that made sense. If not, just I'll, I'll yeah. I'll, I'll, if I'll not, I'm more. sure they will. Yeah, I'm sure they will uh, voice it if it didn't. And uh, just one more question: How could we use these technologies to prepare for the next pandemic? Well, I, I would say research, understand embrace and employ oh, okay okay um the question is now from me i'm just thinking from a uh, if you are a building owner and you would like to apply this technology into your space how much would it cost for example typical office space or um i don't know a classroom to have this technology um would you be able to price it per square meter per number of people? How does it work? So typically the way it would install or, or the way it would be priced, let me just move real quickly if I may to, I think I want, I gotta go back one slide, I'm sorry. Well, maybe not. One slide, there we go. You typically would install it based on the device that you are going to utilize and based on where you are going to place it in the space are in the HVAC system. It's not a difficult task to run a pricing exercise on either a single space or a, a multiple number of spaces or even an entire building or campus. It, mm -hmm. Usually the, the technologies themselves are limited to certain model sizes based on CFM. And you can go in to determine what your end results you know what what the end results are you are trying to achieve do i want to install it in the space or as close to the space as i can or perhaps back in the hvac system at a cooling coil to help remediate mold growth and then you just size the product based on its application and cfm and price it up uh, you may see an installation um a very very simple a fundamental installation for example installed inside a hepa filtration machine such as i show here that might run installed under 1000 US dollars. And then depending on where you put the device and what type it is in the system, it would the price the prices would differ based on size and 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 type and and its application, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be overly um, expensive from a standpoint of first cost and operational cost. There are manufacturers as well that have ionization technology that require no replacement parts and require no cleaning they're they're auto cleaning so you know its first cost is is basically its uh life cycle cost and and typically electrical consumption is in the range of 15 watts or less per device did that answer the question yes yes it's just in the in the industries like i think we have done a um, indoor air quality study in the in north america and this was the one of the technologies that we have included uh, based on the ASHRAE advice, uh, you know, the uh, suitable uh, or tested technologies, let's call it. Um, so therefore we included the UV lights, bipolar ionization as well. Yep. And that's why I just wondered, the uh, end of the day, companies are will be looking to see how much it will cost, basically. Yep. And, yep. and that's why I thought, I'll just ask, because I don't think, I'm not sure if we covered this cost in our um, studies, but I thought that would be interesting uh, to know. Yeah, okay. for any for any design engineers in your audience, you know, you would get with your vendor of choice and you would um, ask them to price the specific technology of choice that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to work with you on budget pricing dollars per square square meter or square foot or cubic foot or whatever the volume uh, uh, metric is that you want to utilize to be able to carry it over throughout the, the rest of the facility. OK, OK. 
Thank you very much, David. Um, Thank you. Yes. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. Uh, we have one more person typing up. I just want to wait for okay. that to come through and then we can say bye to everybody. I'll be happy uh, to. This is the best part for me. I love the Q&A. <laughs> well, you got a lot of questions. You did. Actually. That's good. You really did. <laughs> Uh, yes, the question is, what is the lifetime of those product products? So, so it would depend uh, on which uh, manufacturer's specific technology that you decide to employ. There, there are. I'm going to paint this with somewhat of a broad brush. There Ooh, are two. There are, yeah. there are two basic types of, of of bipolar ionization technology. One is what's called needlepoint bipolar ionization technology. The other is what's known as corona discharge bipolar ionization. One uses carbon fiber needle tips that emit ions directly to the airstream. They typically have, um, they're typically auto cleaning and require no replacement parts. And, and, and the other type is um, the, the corona discharge tube type. Those typically are a bulb that looks somewhat like a UVC light. Those typically would re require cleaning over time and as well, typically replacement every year or two. The, pro the products themselves both have a lifespan somewhere in the range, I would guess, depending on manufacturer, seven to 12 to 15 years. And it would be fortunate. Every eight to 10 minutes you'd have. And we got somebody talking. Uh, that's Alpesh. <laughs> ah, Alpesh. Put yourself on mute. <laughs> I, was trying to, I was trying to mute him, I just couldn't find Sorry. That's, that's all right. So uh, did that come through? Did you hear what I said? I, I'm going to I'm going to throw a number out there. I'm going to say 10 to 10 to 15 years with regards to life. There's two types. One requires maintenance. The other doesn't. Both consume reasonably small amounts of energy. Needlepoint typically will consume around 15 watts per device. Uh, the uh, Corona discharge type would consume energy more on a level consistent with UVC lights. And uh... Um, one last question. So this is the person you were waiting for. Uh, who do you feel has the greatest influence on building owners to adopt uh, these technologies? Is it roadmaps such as the one the US government has just announced and maybe even grants? Or do you feel manufacturers or contractors could have a bigger influence? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm not saying this because I'm speaking to a group of uh, of design engineering professionals in the HVAC industry, but I think you do. The problem I see, and I'm not saying this specifically with regards to you and your your organizations and groups, and I mean no disrespect, but what I typically see are, are engineering professionals that will not put forth an opinion. They will say, the, I'll, Mr. Owner, I'll do whatever it is you want to do. You know, they want to, and I get it. I, I used to be an engineer. You want to, you want to um, distance yourself from any liability. But honestly, I think there are more times that an owner will come back to his trusted engineering advisor and ask for that advisor's advice. And I think you need to be positioned to be able to give that device and or advice. And the only way you can do that, of course, is through through sitting through presentations like this and others that inform you about what's out there and what's available. So y'all, it's in your hands. You know, you're going to save the world or not. <laughs> What's it going to be? <laughs> I'm old. I'm I'm leaving relatively soon. Uh, you know, not not laying down on a stretcher, but you know, I'll retire here in the in the, David, in the somewhat you near playing, future. You keep playing the old card here, David. <laughs> you can't really keep using that. <laughs> oh yes, I can. <laughs> uh, so so good luck. Good luck to all you young young folks out there. <laughs> it's your world. <laughs> yeah, Maru just says, I think, and follow up to what you just said, it's just because of all the uh, val value engineering that takes place. The designers perhaps do specify things, but then by the time it comes to the installing at the contractor level, perhaps it could have been um, swapped with an alternative and so on. I think that's what she's saying. I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I, I see that a lot. Um, you know, obviously one remedy to that might simply be that you, you, you know, if you have the opportunity to engage with an owner before the bid and you can let them know what the true value of these various ancillary um, added components that you've installed to the system are so that they're more than just a dollar price that he can mm -hmm. whip out without much consideration. I think that'll go a long way. But listen, I, I know you're tasked for time and uh, it's difficult to talk to every owner about everything. 
but I think you know the question simply was how can we get these technologies and others to be implemented more effectively in the built environment moving forward? It's going to be communication, mm-hmm. communication yes. with the owner. However, we do that, right? Absolutely, absolutely, and definitely the pandemic actually has helped tackle. Uh, and really uh, draw attention to these sort of technologies. Actually, a better in- indoor environment. Before, we never spoke about it, did we? I mean, it has, like you said, the technologies have been out there for many, many years, decades, but it was just really, it wasn't in the forefront, um, you know, it was on the forefront of the media mm-hmm. or everybody. So it really definitely helped. Uh, that was a, one of the positives probably a pandemic from the pandemic, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. yes. If anything yeah. good came from it, I think moving forward, we should look at, at potentially seeing, you know, definitely more productive, healthier, safer, cleaner indoor environments. My fingers are crossed. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, David. I think we will wrap it up. Have a lovely uh, day. And um, everybody who has attended, thank you very much for your questions. And if you haven't eaten already, have a lovely dinner. I need to go and feed my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet they're angry. They're waiting for you. <laughs> I'm playing computer game. They're really happy because I'm not getting <laughs> them to come off. <laughs> but I need to go and feed them now. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure to meet you. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank you so much. Right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, David. Bye-bye. Thank you.